Welcome to Truth Transforms, transforming hearts and minds through the truth of God's word. My name is Adam Markley, and today we're going to be looking at what is truth in just a moment. Father God, we, uh, we come to you this morning and trusting that your truth transforms, uh, the truth of your word. And I pray that uh, you would help us in this, in this life and in this constant walk of transformation. Help us to be continually transformed to your image, continually conformed to the image of Christ. Lord, I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. What is truth? That is the question. There are all kinds of different ideas that people have. Uh, this person thinks they can believe one truth. This person thinks they can believe another. This religion thinks they can believe a certain truth. And this religion thinks that they can believe another. And they're totally opposed to each other. So who's right? Well, there's only one truth. And there's only one truth. That truth comes from God. And Jesus said, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. He was praying and during his uh, high priestly prayer, he was praying for his disciples at that time, uh, the night before his crucifixion. Uh, and he was praying for disciples of all time saying, Lord, uh, Father God, I pray that you would sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth truth and there we see that it is the word of god that is the ultimate truth uh it is the word of god that is the truth we must believe the truth we must obey and the truth that must be applied into our life it is in fact the truth that transforms us and so i'll be playing another audio sermon here and it is entitled truth transforms here you go well john 17 17 we'll find ourselves in the middle of uh, Jesus' high priestly prayer. He's praying many different things for the disciples. He's praying for their protection. He's praying uh, for their sanctification. He's praying uh, for their unity. And he also prays that their sanctification would make a difference in how, they, in how they live. And let's look at verse 17 here. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And that's what we'll be looking at this morning. We'll be looking at Truth transforms, being the title of the message, Truth Transforms. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father God, we, uh, we come to you this morning in trusting that your truth transforms, uh, the truth of your word. And I pray that uh, you would help us in this, in this life and in this constant walk of transformation. Help us to be continually transformed to your image, continually conformed to the image of Christ. And so I pray that you be with me in delivering your word. Uh, I pray that you be uh, with us all as we receive your word. And help us to respond to your word. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, well, we know that God's word certainly transforms. God's word uh, can transform a rebellious teenager into a God-fearing adult. God's word can, can transform a, a God-hater God into a God-fearer. God's word can take a, a God-hater and turn them into a God-worshipper. Uh, God can transform the soul of, of someone who is running away from God and in rebellion to God because it is tra life-transforming. It is life-producing. God's word is sanctifying. And so we need to be in God's word constantly. We need to be walking with God and in his word so that we will see his sanctifying work. Uh, the, the greatest thing that we can do to not grow in our Christian life is to not be in God's word. So we must be in his word. The evangelist D.O. Moody wrote in the front of his Bible, this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. Uh, so we need to make sure that we stay in this book so that we are kept from sin God's word sanctifies. When we apply God's word, we will see God's results. So let's take a look then at verse 17. And here we're going to see transformational living and transformational truth. Now, the first phrase here, we see transformational living. Uh, Jesus is calling for transformational living when he says sanctify them. Uh, he's calling for sanctification at this time. That is his desire before he's going to be arrested and go to the cross. Uh, his desire is for the believers to be sanctified. Uh, so what does it mean to be sanctified? Well, sanctification means to be set apart. 
Uh, the word means to be made holy. There's an idea here of separation, an idea of holiness, a, a set-apartness, set apart to be made holy. Uh, so obviously we've got, a, we've got separation, we've got holiness. Now the word holy in the Old Testament, often translated as holy, means to cut. It literally means to cut. So uh, God wants us to cut away the evil. Uh, he, wa- he wants us to be cut away from evil, and he wants us to cut the sin out of our life. That's what sanctification is. And we know that God's word cuts, because God's word will, will cut to us, and it will cut the sin out of our life. And so we see the ideas of separation, of holiness. Uh, Jesus even prays, uh, he says the believers are not of this world. They're just like me, they're not of this world. And so there is this idea of separation, but, but he says, he doesn't say send them off on an island on their own. He says, I want them to be in the world, but not of the world. Uh, we should be making a difference. We should be standing out. Uh, Christians should be standing out in, in morality. We should be standing out in our honesty. Uh, we should be standing out in the way we conduct ourselves. We're called to be above reproach, and so that's what we that's what we see here. We're to be in the world and not of the world. We're to be, to, to be a light to the world. So someone that, that knows you or someone that knows different believers might say, boy, they're really radical with their views, you know, because Bible views are really radical in this world. But you know what? I trust that person. Uh, I trust them because they have a history of telling the truth. They have a history of integrity. Uh, so I trust them. I trust that they will live a morally upright uh, life. I would even trust them in that position of trust and in some kind of job because although I may not believe, agree with their uh, beliefs, says the unbeliever, uh, we'll put them in that position because they're trustworthy. They've proven themselves honest. Uh, so we should stand out in some ways in this world. So Jesus prays for the sanctification of his belie- uh, disciples in this prayer. He's praying for all believers everywhere. He's praying for both the believers in the first century and those in the 21st century. Uh, so we see here then the need for transformational living. That's what he's calling for. Now, uh, let's look at sanctification then for a moment because that's exactly what this all is about. It's about sanctification. Now, what exactly is Scripture's teaching on sanctification and how is a believer sanctified? What is the process? So sanctification can be broken down into different elements. These aren't different views of sanctification, but these are different elements, different aspects. So what we have is we have positional sanctification, we have progressive sanctification, and we have glorified sanctification. So we'll start with positional sanctification. Uh, This is our position in Christ. Uh, There there is an element in which we've already been sanctified. Uh, We see that in in Scripture that there are times that sanctification is... is, um, referred to in the past tense. Paul writes his letters, he begins many of his letters by saying, uh, writing to the believers, and he calls them saints, which means holy ones. Uh, This is an idea of positional sanctification. Uh, The Apostle Paul also says in other places, uh, here's other other times it's used in the past tense, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, he says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We also uh, see that we must be considered dead to sin in Romans 6, 9 to 11. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Uh, so positional sanctification is kind of our, our standing before God, that we can trust that, that he has already taken care of our sanctification, although there is certainly a process. Uh, we know that we still sin, and we know that there's a, a lot of work to do. And that brings us to, into progressional uh, sanctification, or progressive sanctification, because this is a lifelong pursuit and growth in holiness. Uh, we know that uh, obviously we're not perfect and we're growing in holiness, so we have progressive sanctification. This is uh, this lifelong journey that we have, uh, the journey where we're growing closer to God. And we should be growing closer to God. We should be growing in our recognition of, of sin, our confession of sin, our repentance from sin. Uh, that should all be occurring. Philippians 2.12 tells us to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Hebrews 12.14 tells us to strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see 
the Lord. So there's certainly a process here. Uh, there's certainly a process in sanctification. And then there is glorified sanctification, and this is just simply when the sanctification is complete, that one day we will be complete, we will be made perfect. Uh, we disagree with some traditions, I think that that can happen on this earth. We cannot be made perfect on this earth, but we certainly should be striving to grow in holiness. We certainly should be uh, striving for godliness. And so, let's talk about progressive sanctification a little bit more, because that's where we spend our life. That's where we spend our life on this earth. Uh, And if you're bogged down by the theological terms, don't worry, I won't get back to them for a moment. But progressive sanctification is the, the time that we live in this life where we certainly have an active role in this process. Uh, there are a lot of different views of sanctification. There's a lot of uh, ideas that either it's either all like works-based, like we, we've got to do this and do that and do that, or it's all just, no, it's, it's all God. God does it all. The phrase sometimes used, although it's not always used for sanctification, is let go and let God. Well, that's not right, but it's also not right that we do it all ourselves. Uh, There's certainly an active role and a passive role. God sanctifies, but we must obey Him. God sanctifies, but we must spend time with Him in His Word, and we must spend time with Him in prayer. Uh, These are agents. These are means that God gives us in the process of sanctification. Uh, So this is the positive aspect of sanctification. We spend time with God in His Word. We spend time with God in prayer. uh, And His Word, His truth, sanctifies us. It it gives us that it is the transforming power. And so it's important to know that. It's important to know that we have uh, something that we need to do in the process of sanctification. uh, That we have something that we're responsible for. And we can't just sit back and think that it's going to happen automatically. The easiest way for sanctification not to occur is to not read your Bible. The easiest way to start living worldly as a Christian is to not read your Bible. The easiest way to not grow in the Christian walk is to close this book. And so we need to know that God's Word sanctifies. It is the truth of God that that works in us and sanctifies us. And if we want to see growth in the Christian walk... Uh, then we've got to be in His Word. But not only just in His Word, we've got to be applying His Word. And so I tell you those because I think it's important to know, and I tell you those because it's easy to get out of balance on that. You might get so focused on the idea that we need to do these things, we need to walk in obedience, uh, that if you go too far with, with that per se, that, that it's all just about what you do, and you forget about the positional sanctification, about, about where we stand in Christ, then it can turn into just legalistic rule-keeping. It can turn into just uh, behavior modification. I just change these behaviors. But if we go the other direction and we say, well, Christ has sanctified us, Uh, Christ has saved us and Christ has sanctified us and I know that there will be a future complete sanctification. So one day we will be made perfect. And you just sit back and think that life's going to happen and think that you're going to grow now in your Christian walk. Well, that's a problem. Uh, You're going to live your Christian life possibly even in a very defeated way Uh, because you understand that that the sanctification process has to occur but you don't understand that you have to be part of it. You have to do your part and to, to follow God and walk in obedience. You've got to understand those things if we're going to walk in the Christian life and grow in the Christian life. Uh, so we certainly can get out of balance and we want to make sure we understand a few things. And so when you look at you know uh, Peter, for example, when he started to walk on water for that brief moment, he, he understood the truth. He understood that uh, Christ was out there. There was an idea that he looked to Jesus, and we ought to look to Jesus. So there's definitely that truth there, uh, but he did more than that. He said, Lord, if it is you, uh, command me to, to come out on the water. And Jesus did, and he followed. He obeyed. Uh, so we must understand, we must look to Christ. We must understand our position in Christ, but we must also obey Uh, We must step out and walk in obedience. Uh, Those are both necessary for growth in the Christian life. 
So we must know our position in Christ, and that's our foundation, but we must also walk in obedience to Christ in order to achieve victory over sin in our lives. And we must walk in obedience to the Word of God, and we must obey the truth. So that brings us then to transformational truth. In the second half of verse 17, uh, it describes transformational truth. So, Jesus said, sanctify them in the truth. They sanctify them in the truth, he says. I- in the truth. This is how uh, we are to be sanctified. And so Jesus shows us how to re- we're to be sanctified. And uh, people are searching for truth. People need truth. The problem in this culture is that they just don't understand that there is one truth. There is one absolute truth. There cannot be more than one truth truth. And Jesus explains in his prayer that not only is there one truth, but this truth is the truth that sanctifies. Uh, This is the truth that transforms. So he says to his followers uh, that they're sanctified in the truth. And your translation might word it differently. It might have have a different translation. So some, many say in the truth. Uh, Some say, King James says, through thy truth. NIV says, by the truth. And the preposition in Greek re- means uh, remaining in place. So whether it's in the truth or by the truth or through the truth, uh, Jesus is praying, keep them in the truth. Uh, keep them in your word. Sanctify them with and through and by and in your word. So then he explains what truth is. Your word is truth. And Jesus continues. So, After praying for the believers to be sanctified, and after praying that they uh, be sanctified by the truth, he defines what the truth is. He says to the Father, your word is truth. So we're sanctified by the truth. Uh, The process of change begins with a knowledge of the truth. And we're given this truth in the word of God. Uh, So we're sanctified by God's word. Uh, Also notice that Jesus didn't say that this is a truth. He said this is the truth. He didn't say that there are different truths. Uh, He said your word is truth. This is the only truth. Uh, Something is either true or false. It's either right or wrong. It's either moral or immoral. Uh, There's no in between. There's no smorgasbord of truth. We can't accept some parts of Christianity and ignore others. We can't adopt beliefs from other religions or philosophical systems Uh, They're contrary to the word of God because that means that they're contrary to the truth of God, which clearly means that they are false. Uh, The idea of absolute truth has been completely eroded in this culture. People think that they can pick and choose. They'll even say, well, that's true for you, but I don't believe it. Uh, You can believe that truth, but I'll believe a different truth. But it doesn't work that way. Something is either true or false. If you were to watch someone run a red light, and they go right through the red light, and, and they're pulled over by the cop now. And the cop comes up and says, hey, you ran a red light. You want to explain this to me? And they turn to the police officer, and they say, well, I understand that you believe that it's red. And I understand that the rest of the world believes that it's red. But I've got a different truth, you see. Uh, when I see a red light, I see a green light. Or the rest of the world sees red, but I see green, and so I just drive on through. Uh, you say, that's absurd. And do you think the officer would let them off of that ticket? He'd say, "Um, here's a ticket, and um, you need to go see somebody. (laughs) He would certainly not let them off of that ticket because there is one truth, there is one reality, there is only one ultimate truth, and that truth is found in Jesus Christ, and that truth is through the Word of God. God's Word is a source of all truth. Truth. Everything must be founded upon God's Word. Everything must be grounded on God's Word. The Bible is God's revelation to mankind. It reveals His nature. It reveals His character. It it reveals His attributes and and everything about us. Uh, That is how we, we know the redemptive plan to come to know the Lord because we learn that God is holy and that we are not, that we are separated, that that there must be a reconciliation that is found through Jesus Christ. Those are all things that we learn from uh, God's Word because the Bible is truth. It's the only truth. It's literally God-breathed. So we can believe it, we can trust it, and we can stake our lives on it. 
Now, there are many good reasons to believe the Bible. There are many reasons why the Bible is true. There are many solid arguments for the inerrancy of Scripture. And so I'm going to take the next 20 minutes and walk through those. No, obviously I'm not. But um, some of you were excited, like two of you. And <laughs> there are many reasons to believe the Bible. Uh, but sometimes the simplest argument is the one to take home. The simplest argument is the one that you can that you can take to your grave because it holds true. I heard someone, a, a, a scholar of sorts, at an inerrancy conference. So this is a conference in which they're talking about the inerrancy of Scripture. They're talking about the truth of God's Word. And he was asked, why do you believe the Bible? He said, you know what, that's a layered question. First off, I believe the Bible because my mama told me it's true. And everyone laughed, but, but there's some real truth in that. Train up a child and they will not turn from their ways, right? So there is some real truth in, in raising up your children to know the truth. Uh, but then he said, secondly, I believe the Bible because it makes sense of the world. And, and, I, and I, I think that's exactly right. Nothing else makes sense of this world. Uh, nothing else can make sense of what's going on in the world. Nothing else can make sense of... The, the wickedness that we see in the world that continues to get worse. There, there's, there's nothing else that can make sense of how we came into being and of all creation. And with all the different religions and philosophical systems and different ideas, there's nothing else that seems to make sense that we can all agree on a few things. We can all agree on some things being wrong. Certainly not all things, but we generally agree that murder is wrong. And we generally agree that rape is wrong. How can many different religions and philosophical systems come to that conclusion? Because we all have a conscience. And although a seared conscience, it's not seared enough in most people uh, to believe that murder is a good thing. Uh, this Bible makes truth of everything in life. And so it is the truth. So God's word is a truth to be obeyed. It is truth that transforms. So then we see from uh, this verse here, we see transformational living and we see transformational truth. And let's remember that it's vital that we apply this truth. It's not enough to just have the truth. We must live the truth. We must apply the truth. Now, sanctification is the process of being made holy. It is growth in the Christian life. Every believer needs to be growing in their walk with the Lord. So you should be growing in your understanding of God. You should be growing in your understanding of sin. If you apply God's word prayerfully and with a humble heart, you can be certain that you will experience change. I don't believe it's possible to come to God's word as a true believer with a humble heart that wants to change, that wants to see God work in your life and apply that to your life and pray for God to use what you're reading in his word to cause a change in your life. I don't believe it's possible as a true believer in Christ to come to God with a heart that wants to change and is in his word and not see change. And if you're not growing in your walk with the Lord, there is certainly the very real danger that you don't know the Lord. Uh, when I talk about sanctification and the idea of positional sanctification, what that means is that the moment that you were saved and the moment that you put your faith in Christ, you began the sanctification process. Uh, there may not have been much fruit to see, uh, but that process had begun. And as you've grown in your walk, there has been more fruit that we've seen, and we know we all need to walk by the Spirit and be led by the Spirit, and that there is fruit of the Spirit that will show in your life, and that should be showing in your life. And so if you come to God's Word with that humble heart, wanting to change, you will change. You say, well, then what kind of change will I experience? And well, you won't just see improved behavior, although that will occur. You won't just see a change in your actions. There'll be a true heart change. Uh, there'll be a true change in your heart and, and a true um, change in your heart to be more sensitive to sin. Uh, there'll be a softening of your heart. There'll be a, a softening of your heart so that there's a love for the Lord. And that should be growing, and you should be growing in your desire to please the Lord. Those are all uh, marks of growth in the Christian life. Now, if you're 
here this morning, you've professed the name of Christ, and so you want to grow. And so you want to know what those marks are. So what are some marks of the believer who is growing in their walk? Well, a believer who's growing in their walk should certainly experience growth in many areas. Uh, One, there should be a growth in recognition of sin. Now, before there can be a growth in recognition of sin, there needs to be a growth in an understanding of sin. Uh, There should be a development of what sin truly is. And so, some of that means, I think you start asking different questions. I think as a, as a baby Christian, you asked, can I get away with it? Is it a sin, right? But that's not the question to ask. The question to ask is, does it glorify God? We've got Valentine's Day coming up. If I, on Valentine's Day... Uh, were to think to myself, what can I get away with? And, and still have you know, a good relationship with, with my wife. She's not going to be upset. What can I get away with? And she might say, oh, well, it's, we're not really going to do much that day. Uh, you know, it's fine. Okay. Then I won't do anything. <laughs> I won't get anything. I, you know, um, it, that would be a wrong motivation. Because I'd be looking for how I can get out of something. Uh, But we desire to please God. And we desire to please our spouse. And so we want to do things to show our love. I would want to do something to show my love. And so that's our desire in the Christian walk is to show our love for God. So we respond in obedience out of love for God. That's always the response. That's always the motivation. And so when we grow in our love for God and, and we grow in our a knowledge of God and our knowledge of His Word and our knowledge of His holiness and our knowledge of sin and of everything else, uh, then it certainly should make a difference in our lives. So, we should grow in our recognition of sin then. So the question for you is simply, are you recognizing sin more in your life than you used to? Are you recognizing sin more in your life? Are you... Um, Growing in your recognition of something that's a sin that maybe you didn't think really was even necessarily a sin in the past. Uh, But now you realize that is a sin and that is something that I need to work on. Uh, Maybe an attitude that you didn't really think attitudes were in the category of sin before. It was only actions and now you're like, yeah, you know what, I've got an attitude I've got to work on. Uh, There should be growth in our recognition of, of sin. Uh, that it's a heart issue, that all sin, ultimately, all any actions of sin, outward sins, come from inward sins, from inward thoughts and inward actions. And so there should be growth in sensitivity to sin. Uh, So are you more sensitive or less sensitive to sin? Are you uh, growing in sensitivity to sin or growing in callousness to sin? Uh, That's a very reflective and serious question for us to ask and answer of ourselves and take it to the Lord in prayer. So there should be growing sensitivity to sin. There should be growth in repentance. Are you becoming quicker to repent or slower to repent? Uh, are you apologizing to your spouse, spouse faster than you used to if you uh, do something wrong and sinful? That's something to consider. Also, there should be growth in confession of sin. Are you confessing your sin before God and those you sin against Not necessarily more often, but when it occurs, are you quicker to do it? Hopefully it's not more often, because hopefully it's not happening as often. Uh, But are you you coming with confession? Are you confessing your sins to one another? We should be growing in each of those areas. You know, if you're more troubled by uh, something that you do now that you weren't as troubled about a couple of years ago, that's a good thing. Not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Um, hopefully it's happening less often. Hopefully there is growth in some area, but that's certainly a good thing if God is working on your heart and you're less callous about your sin. Uh, that hard coding is being breaking, broken down and God is actually getting to you. His word is getting into you and you're recognizing some sinful patterns that you might need to work on. 
Uh, so when I talk about recognition of sin and sensitivity to sin, I don't just mean sensing it in others better or recognizing it in others better or, or, or having a better biblical knowledge of the doctrine of sin and knowing that mankind is totally depraved. I mean your sin. Are you recognizing yours and becoming more sensitive of your specific sins? Because that is part of the very necessary process of sanctification. It is a purifying and God is purifying us. And it's, it's often very, it's never easy. It's often, you feel beat up at times in the process of sanctification. But it's for our good. It's for our purification. I, uh, I heard something about the process of, of a purification process before. And uh, I want to share that with you. Maybe it could help us think through this. It was a, a few years ago, and, and uh, Melinda and I were in town for a friend's wedding, and I was driving home from the rehearsal dinner, and her friend was talking away about a brand of essential oils she had begun to sell. Uh, she said, I really believe in this brand of essential oils. Okay, why is that? Well, because this brand of essential oils is more pure than other brands. Okay, why is that? Well, because um, what they do is they have a rigorous testing process, all right? So uh, everyone knows about the need for purification in essential oils. There is a, a purification that needs to occur, and they need to have a certain form of purity. There are pesticides and different impurities. So they put them through a testing process, and there's a, a stage one purification. And it goes through that stage one, and it's been purified. Now, there are still some impurities and often untraceable, but they put them in a second stage, a second process of purification. And as she continued to rave about these essential oils and the drive home in that car, she said, this is when most companies put it on the market. Uh, so most companies put it on the market, but this company, they do a third and final purification process. Even though it's not traceable, even though you can't see it, they put it through this final process before it is sealed for completion. And she said it just like that. The last part, at least. And, and I thought, wow, well, <laughs> God was preaching to me while I was driving the car. I was like, that is just like the Christian walk. That is the purification process that we go through. It is a testing process. It is a rigorous process. Uh, but we must go through it. We must trust that God is working in us and conforming us to the image of Christ, which is the ultimate goal of Christianity, to be conformed to the image of Christ and to share Christ with others. So we must trust God and we must trust that he is doing the sanctification work in us and we must respond in obedience by being in his word and in prayer. And we must remember that when we apply God's word, we will see God's Result. When we apply God's word to all areas of our life, we will see growth in those areas. Uh, so let's certainly remember that truth transforms. God's truth transforms. Let's pray. Well, Father God, we do praise you and worship you and thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for your word that transforms, your word that is truth. Now help us to apply that truth in our lives, apply that truth to our heart, and come to you trusting that the Spirit of God will work within us through the word of God to bring about transformation. And I pray that would happen in each and every one of us as we continue to walk with you, Lord. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, certainly a reminder just how much we all need to be applying God's word in our life. Uh, not only do we need to know the truth, we need to apply the truth. We need to be obedient to Christ in all that we do. And it's through our walk of obedience as we dig into God's word and we seek to apply God's word and we ask in prayer for the Spirit's help to apply God's word in our life, that we will see growth in the Christian walk. That is truly the truth of God transforming us. Uh, that, that's a transformational living that we will continually have as long as we're constantly digging into God's word, constantly applying that looking at our, our sin, dealing with our sin, asking God to help us deal with our sin, 
uh, growing closer to God, meditating on scripture, doing all of those things that we, so that we can constantly be in communion with Christ, worshiping Christ, uh, desiring to live for Christ. And if we do that, we'll certainly be living a transformative life as we grow closer to Christ. So I pray that uh, uh, you would get into God's word today and continually and be transformed by his truth. God bless. Thank you for watching. I do hope that was a blessing. Uh, if you did appreciate that, be sure to like it, share it with others, and uh, hit that subscribe button. If you're on YouTube, you'll be notified of new videos whenever they come out. And God bless you. Have a great day.